Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first in this new series, uh, new innovation for us. Uh, thank you especially to, first of all, to all of our partner organizations that have helped us to publicize this event. Uh, we have people in, uh, in South Wales, in our Associated Youth Theatres in Caerphilly, in the Palace Theatre in, in Redditch. Thank you to all of you to Theatre Acting Club in Bucharest, and also to AATG in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, we will have time for some questions as we go along. We're almost certainly not going to get to everyone, but do put your questions into the Q&A uh, the Q &A area. We will try to get to some of them at least. Um, uh, and I'm going to hand over pretty much straight away to Simon. Simon is our host. The host with the most. Thank you very much, Simon, for making this all possible. Simon has created this whole program. And uh, some of you, indeed, some of our, our UIT students might know Simon as the, um, as the demon stage manager from our production of 1066 and all that a couple of years ago. Um, he is, uh, of course, first of all, the patron of uh, the English Youth Theatre in Brussels. And we're very lucky to have him. And he, uh, he provides all kinds of different support, advice um, that, we, that we couldn't do without. So thank you very much, Simon. And I'm going to hand straight over to you. Good evening. And it's good to be talking to people, really, as, as we have over, over um, COVID, sort of talking to people all around the world. So that's really joyous. As I say, my name is, as Glenn said, my name is Simon. And my day job, when I'm not patron of EYT, is I am um, the rector, that's the equivalent of the vicar, of the Actors' Church in London, St Paul's Covent Garden. And the Actors' Church has got a particular uh, ministry to the theatre community. That goes right back to 1662, uh, if you want to know about it. I'm going to give you lots and lots of things I want you to look up um, to be very interactive uh, during these four sessions. So uh, have, have, your, have your phone ready to, to make a few notes. Most important though, is to introduce to you, uh, somebody who really needs no introduction, um, the extraordinarily talented uh, Liz Robertson. And Liz is going to be our professional witness for this evening. Um, and I will talk a little bit about, more about Liz in just a minute. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of an overview of what we're going to do, and then I'm going to talk to Liz, and then we will take some questions as and when we can. We've already had a huge number of questions that you've sent in, which thank you so much for them. If we don't get to them all this evening, I apologise, uh, but we will pick up some of them in some of the other sessions. Um, one of the reasons we're doing this is that we would like, if you are able and we recognize times are extremely tough for everybody at this point, but for no organization is life as tough as it is, frankly, at the moment for the professional theater. As you know, it's closed down all around the world. Nobody's working, which means nobody's making any money. And as a result of this, the theater, the combined theatrical charities, which includes St. Paul's Church, uh, we are all part of something called Acting for Others. And normally, we come together and we support numerous organizations and people who've fallen on hard times. And this time, for the first time, we are asking people to support the profession because we really do need it so if you go if you google acting for others you can make a donation but i it's at the bottom of your screen now so if you or perhaps your parents uh, can make a donation to acting for others that would be great but we recognize that may not be possible for all of you now this came about because i was talking to lynn and i know that some of you are thinking of doing the lambda uh, course in musical theater and I would really encourage you to do that. It's, it's uh, a wonderful part of the theatre industry. I think it's worth noting that the two most popular, so, uh, commercially successful pieces of entertainment ever are, until 2014, when it was overtaken by The Lion King, was in fact The Phantom of the Opera. And that show has made a profit of more than $6 billion. 
Uh, Liz was actually in that, but I don't suppose you took a huge chunk of that six billion, did you, Liz? No, I, I, no, <laughs> not, even, not even a little tiny, 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 tiny percentage of it. <laughs> no. Um, so, so musical theatre is extraordinarily popular. Um, probably the most importantly commercial part of our whole industry. Um, frankly, without musical theatre, um, the West End of London and Broadway would be, would be virtually non-existent. So I just want to take about five minutes to tell you how musical theatre came to be. And you can go and research this. And all the words that don't mean much to you, just Google and look them up and uh, I'll mark your homework later. Just joking. So musical theatre as we know it now is a curious combination of a number of different pre-existing forms. One of them was a British uh, form called British Comic Opera. And that you can still see, again, if you YouTube, in the works primarily of Gilbert and Sullivan. You may or may not have heard of them. They wrote shows like The Pirates of Penzance, The Mikado, Iolanthe, and so on. And that was a 19th, early 20th century British tradition. And Gilbert and Sullivan is still very popular. Personally, I can't stand it, but it's very, very popular. And that kind of melded with European operetta. And that largely came about because of the huge number of people who emigrated from Europe in the course of the 20th century, as you know, if you know your history, 20th century Europe was not exactly a, a great place to be. And that a lot of those very talented people ended up in the United States. There, they particularly became uh, aware of an entirely American uh, phenomenon, which were minstrel shows. Uh, very politically incorrect nowadays. People used to, white people used to black up um, and do minstrel shows. Pretty, pretty ghastly stuff, but a very distinct form of theatre. And it also linked up with what was known as vaudeville. And vaudeville in America were basically song and dance shows. They didn't have a plot. Somebody came on, did their act, and went off again. And the extraordinary melding of all of those forms, and others, I haven't got time to go into all of them, but that melding created something that was distinctively American and became known as musical comedy or musical play. And the first show that most people recognize as a modern musical is an absolute masterpiece called Showboat. And Showboat was written in 1928. Again, Google it. And please listen to some of the songs because they are some of the most beautiful songs ever written. Um, so have a look at Showboat. It's for, considered really the first modern musical uh, written by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II. And that ushered in a period that was is generally recalled, is recalled, known as the Golden Age. And the Golden Age of musical theatre ran from about 1928, two arguments vary, but say till 1960. And it included some extraordinary shows. Um, and, and again, you can look, them up, look up Rodgers and Hammerstein, you will find shows like Oklahoma, Carousel, The Sound of Music. And... One show in particular, which has been called The Perfect Musical. It was adapted from a play called Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. And it was written in 1956 by Alan J. Lerner and Frederick, known as Fritz Lowe. And that musical is called My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady opened on Broadway in 1956 starring Julie Andrews, Rex Harrison, and Stanley Holloway. If you haven't heard of any of those people, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves, but go away and look them up. And it was hailed as perhaps the greatest musical ever written. It had an extraordinary run by those days. In those days, shows didn't last anywhere near as long 
as they do nowadays. I mean, Phantom of the Opera has been running for 30 years or more. That simply didn't happen back in those days. The economics were very different. People couldn't travel. It, it, it was a very different thing. But My Fair Lady ran in London for over six years in the biggest theatre in London, the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. And it became an instant classic. In 1979, My Fair Lady was revived by producer Cameron McIntosh, who I trust you have heard of. Again, if you haven't, look him up. But Cameron McIntosh um, produced a new production of My Fair Lady and cast in it a rising young star called Liz Robertson. And this is Liz. And so, Liz, and Liz, you subsequently married Alan J. Lerner, who wrote My Fair Lady, and became his, became his wife, did you not? I did, I did indeed. Yes, I did. Uh, we, we met when he, well, we met originally when he came to see the show when it was on tour in Nottingham. And uh, he saw the show then, and Cameron had said to Alan, I want to take it into the West End. And Alan said, well, it needs a bit of, you know, tidying up and redirection here and there. So Cameron then said, would you like to redirect it? And, and Alan thought, well, I've got nothing else to do. So yes. So he, came, <laughs> left, so he left, he left uh, his home in America and came over to London in uh, September of 79 uh, and started rehearsals, page one, scene one, act one, um, with all of us, having done it for a year on the road. But it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. Of course, you know, we're getting it from the horse's mouth. Um, he was a great fan and, in fact, deeply loved the original director who was called Moss Hart, who tragically died far too early, just after Camelot um, um, had been produced. And, uh, and he was a wonderful, wonderful director who Alan admired enormously. And basically, he just put into practice what Moss had wanted all along, uh, with a few tweaks here and there to make it a bit more, more not modern, but bit to make it speak better in 1979 be more, more approachable in 1979 than it would have been in 1956. So, yes. And then I married him. Uh, <laughs> Dear Reader, I married him. And, <laughs> and Eliza, who is the leading lady in, mm -hmm. in My Fair Lady, um, it's considered one of the hardest roles in musical theatre. What, what is it that makes Eliza both difficult to play and, and, and wonderful to play? Well, um, for a start, the acting role, you need some chops for that. Um, the first person to play Eliza was Mrs. Patrick Campbell, and she was in her 40s. So she had actually um, had the, the opportunity in Pygmalion um, to have had quite a few other plays um, under her belt before she got to play that wonderful role of Eliza Doolittle. Um, but, and secondly, it is an enormous range of singing for, for the Eliza. So the first sounds you hear from Eliza, the awful well, they're not shouldn't be strangulated, but they sound strangulated Cockney sounds like ow, ee, and and so you think immediately you're going for your throat, um, and then she sings songs like "Just You Wait," Henry Higgins, you know, which is all very much um, uh, with you, it's staccato and it's, it's down on the chest. Hard, yes, and it's a chesty, it's a chesty song, but that particular scene starts when she sings that song. That's a, uh, that starts a scene which goes into the rain in Spain, which goes into I could have danced all night. You don't even get off to have a cup of tea. <laughs> so you don't get a glass of water, nothing. So basically those three songs are enormous um, songs to do, especially from Just You Wait, Henry Higgins, which is all glottal, eh, 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 to the, the floating head voice of I could have danced all night at the end of that scene. And you've got a fairly horrendous note at the end of I could have danced all night, haven't you? Yeah, top A. It's yeah. a top A. And, and that's not even the end of Act One, is it? No. No, I think it's the You've last got to go on. Yeah, you know, this last song she sings in, the, in, in Act One. But yes. then, then you've got a quick change into Ascot, and then, and then, um, then the, the Ascot takes over. Then you've got Freddie coming in, singing on the street where you live, and, uh, and then you go to the ball. But then Act Two is, is pretty difficult because you've got um, Show Me, which is another really hard, passionate song. Belt. Song. In a kind of gentle version of "Wouldn't It Be Lovely," and then of course "Without You," which is when she makes her stand and and uh, and she's you know she shows she shows Higgins that I can do without you, uh, but again that's that's kind of a mix of chest and and head, so yes. And, and famously, of course, um, 
says, I can do bloody well without you, which in exactly. the time... Yes, I know, exactly. Well, of course, um, bloody wasn't quite the, the uh, swear word uh, in, even in 1956, as it was in uh, 1920, when it was 28, when Pygmalion was first written. Yeah. Then she said, then, then the Eliza, when they said, um, uh, uh, can I give you a lift? Are you going to walk? She says, not bloody likely. Not really likely. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a taxi. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, that was really shocking. So Alan tried to shock um, the, the audience by putting, move your blooming ass in at the end at the end of ascot and that was his way of bringing people out to see he didn't want to use the bloody until the very end um, yes what brilliantly mm. i i did have an idea i was doing pygmalion once and i had the idea which got vetoed by the director of replacing the bloody um i'm taking a bloody taxi with i'm taking a F word taxi, because I think that would have had the same sort of shock effect. That, exactly. that and, exactly. and how long did you play Eliza uh, uh, in did, the I, West End? I did a year on the road, then I did a year in town. Um, but wow. Prior to that, I had played Eliza when I was 22, which you, you may not have known. Um, no, I, I didn't. No, I, I did at the Liverpool Playhouse. I was in Side by Side by Sondheim, um, understudying both Julia McKenzie and Millie Martin. And uh, Julia very sweetly said to me, you know, you should go up there. there there's an audition, you know, for uh, My Fair Lady in Liverpool. You should go up for it. I went, what part? <laughs> she said, <"Hey." laughs> I said, oh, really? Never occurred to me. I always saw myself as Barbara Streisand. Wrong. You know, I mean, I've been, <laughs> I've been called Jules and Mary from a really early age, by, teased by my school friends. In fact, there was an awful rumour going around at school that I was the illegitimate daughter of Julie Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, ironically, you do actually know Julie Andrews, don't I know, you? I know Julie, yes, I know. But the fact that I thought of myself as Barbara Streisand is just, I think, just blindness on my behalf. So I went <laughs> up to the audition and I got it. And it was six weeks at Liverpool Playhouse. And I'd had no singing training, no acting training either. Listen, folks, you, know, this, you need this. You need acting training and singing training. But I had none because I was primarily a dancer. Um, anyway, and can you just ex tell a little, uh, us a little bit about the, the, the years as a dancer and, yes. and explain what Young Generation was? Because again, our, our I, viewers I, won't know. I started, I started dance classes at the age of three um, and uh, just loved them. And, and just, you know, uh, I think my mother was quite taken you know, back, by the way. I just took to it like a duck to water. I adored it and and sang and did all that and, and we did little shows we did pantomimes so I had a bit of acting in that way um but I also um entered competitions <laughs> from the age of five I was I was we were, I was a Butlin holiday girl and it's like a holiday camp for anybody who doesn't know what Butlins is like a bit like center parks but not quite as posh um anyway uh, and I would enter these competitions and I would win and my mother was like oh my goodness so uh, <laughs> she's quite good. <laughs> so uh, my, she told my dancing teacher, who then took me under her wing and and kind of paid a bit more attention to me and gave me and gave me extra classes and things. And I I, anyway, I grew up with this wonderful teacher called Betty Finch. So I was trained at the Finch Stage School, and there that she had two children, Linda Finch and Roger Finch, both in the profession, who would come and give us dance classes. Roger would give us acting lessons, you know. Um, but I left that at sixteen to become a dancer at the Savoy Hotel in, uh, in, in a cabaret, not the show cabaret, in a cabaret. Um, and then I was in a summer season, but I had a song to sing in that uh, at the end of a pier as a dancer. And then I joined the Young Generation, which was a hugely successful television mm. dance group where you had to dance and sing and present. So so just to, to explain to our younger viewers, in those days, we had a lot of TV entertainment shows. They, they were sorts of variety shows, in they a were sense. variety shows, yes. And, and, and they were very, very popular. And there were only, in those days, two or three TV channels. I know you won't believe that, but ask your grandparents. It really is true. <laughs> and um, so there would be the Les Dawson show <laughs> and so on. And all of these groups had, had troops of dancers. And the young generation were huge, weren't they? Massive. In all sense of the word, because we were we were fifteen girls and fifteen boys. So can you imagine wow. the BBC? There were 30, 30 dancers, and we would do um, five routines a week. We had our own show. 
we had our own young yeah. generation show. We, we were we were the stars of the show, so we would interview people. And but what what was so wonderful about that was we were all individuals. Most dance troupes, you had to look alike, dress alike be the same height, do the same steps, lift your leg up to a certain height and you're know, not any higher, don't show off. And you must know in chorus line, that wonderful line, don't, don't flip your head, Cassie, because yeah. she's doing too much. You know, keep, keep, keep your legs down. And you're all gonna be in one line, the chorus line, literally is a bit like the Rockettes. You have no individual personality in that line at all. Um, but we had that in the young generation. And I was with them for three years and then I left um, <laughs> to be it's been a very, very brief, I was in a pop group, which didn't go anywhere. And then I went into a, a thing called Give a Dog a Bone at the Westminster Theatre. And which I- Which has now been demolished, but I presume that wasn't your fault. No, no. <laughs> and, it was, and I was playing Madam Cow. There we go. There you so, go. Yeah, there we go. That was my very first pr uh, professional theatrical appearance as Madam Cow. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was understudying uh, one of the leads in that, and, and she had quite an operatic voice. And I had an agent, and I had to go on for her, and he came to see it, and he said, I didn't know you could sing like that. And I said, oh, well, yes, I can. And he said, well, I'm going to put you up for a little night music. Now, a little night music, wow. I'm sure um, your students may not know, um, was written by Stephen Sondheim, and it was his probably, I would think Company was his first hit as such. Yes. Um, that brought but then the, Night and Music. And then A Little Night Music, um, which um, had the song Send in the Clowns, of course, which was a number one hit for Judy Collins. So um, anyway, I got that job. I was, I was uh, one of five singers in it. We were kind of like um, the chorus. Oh, you were one of the leaders? Libus leader singers, yes. Yes. We were like, we were like a Greek chorus. We commentated on, on, on what was going on on stage and things like that. Um, but from that, uh, in that show was a man called David Kernan and the musical director was a wonderful man called Ray Cook. And they were devising a show along with Ned Sharon, Millicent Martin and Julia, and, and Julia McKenzie, a show about Sondheim called Side by Side by Sondheim. And I was asked to go along and audition when it, when it actually got a, uh, a little run at the Mermaid Theatre. They wanted an understudy and I understood both the girls, but it was a massive hit. And that yeah. was where I first met Cameron McIntosh. That was his very first uh, professional hit as well that he'd had. He'd been around for a while, but he hadn't had a hit. Um, I, I think he was 28 or something, and I was 21 or something ridiculous. I mean, we were very, we were very young. We were terribly young. Um, but I, that's when I met Cameron. And, and it was a massive hit. And from there, I went into Fair Lady, and Cameron drove up on his way to Scotland, as he often did um, for his New Year's Eve, and he kept popped into Liverpool to see me. And he then, it's a very long story, sorry about this. And then That's he, great. And then he said to me, um, he's wanting to get the Arts Council, because he didn't have the money himself. He was still a very poor producer. So he went into a partnership with the Arts Council, and they produced the tour of My Fair Lady, which was then, yes, it would have been, it would have been well, well overdue. It was 56. And we were doing it in 78, 77. Yeah, 70, so over 20 years. years. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and, and needed to be seen again. And he said, no, Absolutely. That so that's how I got the part. So, in a sense, so would you say generally that you think a, a, a full professional training is a good idea before you launch yourself into the. I, I, I do, actually. I do. I felt very underprepared playing that role. And indeed, I was underprepared playing that role. Um, um, especially when I was 22 or whatever. Uh, yeah, that was awful. So I then, um, I then had singing lessons with a wonderful singing teacher called Ian Adam, who, who uh, tragically died quite a while ago now, um, who, yes. who had everybody. Michael Crawford, that's how he got Phantom, because Sarah Brightman heard him singing at Ian Adams, and she, and he, he, she thought, who's that singing? He's be perfect for the Phantom. It turned out it was Michael Crawford, but everybody yeah. met Ian Adam. And he was one of those extraordinary singing teachers that could spot your your flaws but still but, but without breaking you down completely we're still giving you the confidence because i was singing every night i was going to him yes the west yeah. end every night but he didn't make me feel i couldn't do it i it was it was i don't know how he did it but he gave me the confidence to because as a dancer you you breathe you breathe up here you don't drop your you don't drop, drop your breath into your lower diaphragm at all so I had to learn how to drop my breath 
And for the acting side, Alan was wonderful. And I had, the, of course, the divine Tony Britton to, who helped me enormously. But I would say, I would say you gain so much more if you actually uh, have those three years um, with a, a wonderful college, arts college, performing arts college. Um, you you just, get much more. Just, just on that, um, and this is a question coming from Eliza. Um, she's play, sorry, she's playing Eliza in, in her in her school or something. Right. And how do you approach those massive roles? And in particular, something about the, uh, we, we saw in the last revival of My Fair Lady, a certain lady was constantly off yeah. because she didn't look after her body and her, her voice. Yeah. Just wonder if, you know, a couple of things on Eliza specifically, but then something a bit more general about how you look after your instrument, I think would be okay. useful. Okay, well, Eliza, um... It is, it is a massive role. And I think the only thing you can do is when you, when you look at that script is, is not panic initially um, and take it moment by moment. And that's one thing that Alan taught me. He said, you know, you, it's, it's, not, it's, not around, it's, not, it's not the whole thing. You're not trying to act the whole thing. You're acting each moment. And I think if you, if you break it down into little bits, it becomes much easier for, for you to, to feel confident in doing. And also, it's more truthful because you are literally yeah. as you would do your as you would live your life. You don't live your life as in the day. You don't don't get up in the morning and act the whole day. You act each minute, each moment. Um, oh. Go on. Oh, and would you say that applies through the songs as well as through the speech? Yes, I would. I would absolutely. Um, yes, because especially in Show Me, there's so much emotion in Show Me, and and I could have danced all night. The initial one is just sheer joy. You know, oh my God, I, and, and, and you're trying to tell the maids and everything what's going on. And then you're being told to quiet and down, quiet and down. And then you've got the lovely Mrs. Pierce saying, it's time to go to bed now. And then you're just reminiscing. And so, I mean, even though it's the same words, same tune, it's different, different feelings, different, different emotions. Um, yes, so yes, break everything down. Break everything down. Um, also speak it, speak, speak the songs. That's another thing I've learned. Um, over the years is that at times when, when you sing um, uh, it sounds lovely but but it doesn't mean anything but if you actually speak it first you know I, I could have danced all night I could have danced all night and still have bed for more you know you actually I could have spread my wings and suddenly just by speaking it and it's not meant to be heard like that I mean Alan would kill me <laughs> if he thought I was going to go and just speak his lyrics because he said they're meant to be sung but it just helps you with your acting if you actually I, speak the lyric I think that's so important because I, I I was taught to do that and I must admit at the time I thought oh, this is ridiculous I feel an absolute idiot standing here saying these words but it does make a difference so do that with your singing and that wonderful advice from Liz stay in the moment don't yeah. you know it's like eating an elephant to break it down into Stanislavski talked about all this stuff didn't he in, in a very uh, different way but um but just break it down and say um I just want to as far as taking uh, care uh, we'll come, you were saying you went back to sorry. Take care of the instrument do you wanted to know that now Simon? yes okay. yes please so again I was very young uh, when I first played Eliza and not much older when I played it the second time and of course when you've got a youthful body your body can stand much more <laughs> <laughs> as you get older tell me about it but i but i still learned pretty quickly because um i was the i was the age of of the wonderful chorus we had you know the dancers and the singers and they were all my age and i loved them dearly and i wanted to go and party with them oh no, no you couldn't do that you couldn't do that i learned very early on and in fact it was chris walker who was my musical director on the road in, in belly and he said liz you can't play you can't play he said We'll go out for a meal or something, be good to bed, and I would learn that's exactly what you have to do. You don't you, you can't play. So you may love these people to bits and you can have a giggle with them, but you don't go out and party all night. You go, you have a, maybe a quiet meal with a friend, or I would often go home and um, and just have a cup of tea or something. Uh, uh, and in the morning, take care of yourself. I, I would exercise, I would I would do my dance exercise or go out for a long walk and vocalize towards the end of the day. I'd have an afternoon sleep, especially with Eliza. I'd always have a, a kip about sort of three o'clock to four o'clock. Um, you just need it. It's, it's, a, it's a three hour piece, you know, three mm. hour plus mm. in some instances. Yeah. And you're on yes. stage 90% of that time. So you've got to 
And also, you've got to remember, people are paying money to see you, you know? And, and if you don't go out there in the peak of health, then, you know, they are, they're not getting the performance they should be getting. I remember saying to you once, we were talking about this unfortunate habit of, of leading ladies and gentlemen going off rather a lot nowadays. Um, and I said to you, did you go over off? And you said, it was my role. Nobody else was going to play it. You know, and you work hard to get that role. And if you're going to just give yeah. it up, forget it. No way. No, because no. when I did Eliza, it was at the time I, I opened just after Avita had opened. And Elaine had, had got this in her contract. She could only do six shows a week because that was an enormous thing. And I, I understand that. But, she's, but she actually did say to me afterwards, you know, you let me down because you actually did the full eight shows a week. And I said, well, I know, but it was, I mean, it was, it was a different kind of feeling. And of course, Julie Andrews did eight shows a week. So I wasn't going to turn around and say, I can't do eight shows a week. But Elaine was, no. she, she was the first of each. And it was a absolute. It was a, it, it, Evita is a, ma- it, it actually is very similar to, in the sense that you're down on the chest and you're up in the head. It's all over the place. I mean, interestingly, no, Patti Lepone. I mean, if you think, who, it's, it's an opera. And if you think yes. about the singers, how they many do it times? twice a week. Exactly. Yeah. They don't do eight shows a week. So even no. more, you've got to take care of yourself. Even more. It's quite know. interesting, given that she went on, again, if you don't know, Julie Andrews went on to star in a little film that's quite well known called The Sound of Music. And when she was doing My Fair Lady, she said, you have to live like a nun, which is to say, given that she went on to play a nun, was quite yes. interesting. But you yes. have to live like a nun. Like a nun. You have to live like a nun. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we could talk for hours. We do talk for hours. And, and Liz has also done Phantom of the Opera, which I would love to talk to you about. But we've got Rosie, your dear friend, our dear friend Rosie, is talking about that next week. Um, I'd love to talk about Love Never Dies because uh, that's the f- sequel to The Phantom, which didn't do very well, but you were brilliant in and I loved and I saw it <laughs> times. Um, but we ought to take some questions. So okay. Okay. these are some of the questions I've been asked to ask you. Um, some of them... Um, I, th- I think we've, we've covered, really. Yeah. Um, but this is an interesting one. Somebody's asked, is it important to have an agent? And if so, how do you go about getting one? It, uh, it is important to have an agent. Um, they, they have their ear to the ground far yeah. more than we can. Um, and getting one, well, I mean, again, uh, I was, I was, I, I, did, I didn't see, when I, when I first started, it was a stage. The stage had all the, Dance yes. auditions on the back page. So that's how I got my jobs initially. Even the young generation is how I got it. But then I met uh, a BBC director who uh, knew I wanted to lead the young generation and said, um, well, I, know, I know of this um, commercial that's happening and I think you should go up for this commercial. So I went up for the commercial and the casting director said, do you have an agent? And I said, no. And she said, you have one now. And she gave me the name of someone. So I mean, that was just oh. luck, just sheer luck. But now, the way you get an agent now is usually at the end of your third year at drama school. Um, they, they do a wonderful showcase of all their pupils, and they invite many agents to come and see that. And, and that's where you usually get an agent. Or, or if, you, if you're not lucky enough, um, like we can't now showcase anything, when lockdown, no. when lockdown ends, write something, write something. Um, you know, uh, uh, something personal to yourself and perform it on screen or, or work out a little one-woman show, one-man show that you could do somewhere and invite people. I mean, the agents are going to be so hungry for young talent which because they haven't found any because they haven't been able to go to any showcases. No. So which actually, that, that raises another question which somebody's asked for, uh, which is when you see young actors coming through, what qualities do you particularly look for? What, what, you know, you said you were very great friends with your sort of dancer mates and things. What, 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 what do you spot? What do you notice? What do you look Commi- for? Commitment. I, you know, I, 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 I'm afraid I'm a firm believer in commitment. And anybody who turns up late for rehearsals or play, messes around in rehearsals or, you know, takes as much time of I haven't got time for. Anybody who doesn't turn up wearing the costume properly. Oh, I forgot to put that on. You know, I'm sorry. You know, I really, commitment to me, if you're, if you're in a show, you have to commit to it. You have to give it your all, no matter how big a part you've got. Um, and, and if you don't, you shouldn't, you should give it to someone else. Give that job to someone else. Um, and, and then, of course, if you do, I, again, I was encouraged. When I, when I did a little night music, 
uh, Mariah Aitken and David Kernan and people like that, they encouraged me and, Roy, and Ray Cook, they, they, they said, you know, uh, they got behind me. So they saw something in me and Ray um, used to ask me to sing at various auditions because he was writing musicals at the time. And I had to sing in front of Lee Remick, who sadly not many of you wonderful students would know her name, but she was, again, Google it, <laughs> Google her, a wonderful actress, wonderful film actress. And, um, but you know, those, those kind of opportunities to, to workshop something, uh, they're always very, very useful. And if someone says to you, I'd like you to workshop something you've never heard of, do it because it's the experience and you never know where it's gonna lead. And they obviously see something in you that they want to bring out. So, um, yes, the commitment overall. You, I mean, there's other ways. Mm. But that's fascinating. Uh, and, and listen to what Liz is saying, because that, that's so important. Um, another question, again, leads on quite nicely. Our teachers say, always bring a pencil to rehearsal, never be late. What are your golden rules? Oh, well, I, well pencil for, for the script, but also, um, I, 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 I guess this sounds awful, but I bring my phone because often you, you, the director's talking, and like my, our, our first day of rehearsal of Love Never Dies, the wonderful, amazing Jack O'Brien, just talked about the play for a long time. So we all had our phones on it and we all taped it, um, um, recorded it, because it was so essential to hear it back afterwards. And, this, and you couldn't have written all that down in time. So, I mean, obviously, I, a phone, I think a phone is essential because you, you get all your music on there, um, you, you, get, you maybe get some tidbits from the director on there, um, but don't ever be late. Don't ever be late. And again, um, you know, come, come with, don't come hungover. <laughs> if you arrive on time, make sure you've got, you've got your brain in gear. Um, and, uh, and just listen and learn. Um, never be, never be frightened to say, I don't know how to do this. That's the other thing. Um, uh, and I, I was scared to say that. I still am. Um, but don't be, because uh, that's what the director's there for. That's absolutely what the director's there for. So um, have the confidence or the, or the choreographer to say, why am I doing this? Um, what, what's, my, what's my reason behind this? Um, but yeah, pencil, phone, never be late. <laughs> Trevor Nunn famously spends the whole first day of rehearsals talking about the play. Yeah, and yeah. He, he's so erudite, he's so knowledgeable. And people just can't take it in. You know, yeah. you imagine a sort of five hour lecture from Trevor um, would be truly scary. So yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so I think you've sort of answered that, about this, but um, who would you say has been the most influential person in your career and who's made the biggest impact on your career? Would that be Alan? Well, I think, yes, well, Alan's obviously made the biggest impact on my career by marrying him. But and your life. <laughs> yeah, my life, yes, exactly. Um, um, but I think, well, to Tony Britton was, mm. was um, and so was Anna Neagle. I mean, Anna Neagle, well, I, but I didn't realise her, her real name uh, was Marjorie Robertson. <laughs> So we were known. It doesn't, as, it doesn't scan, does it? I mean, it doesn't scan. But we were known as the Robertson sisters because when we when, when, uh -huh. when we were in Liverpool, when we were in Leicester, we first started. We had to share a dressing room together, so they put up the Robertson sisters, which I thought was brilliant. I loved it. But she she gave me some wonderful advice. I mean, again, she said it's lonely out there. Gillian Lynn said, you know, when you when you when you get to a certain point in your career and you're playing leads, it's lonely because you can't you can't play. You know, Gillian Lynn was a hugely influential, hugely influential. Even though I only did the two shows with her, she'd come to see everything I did and give me, you know, give me pointers. Wendy Toy was somebody else who, who meant a lot to me. She, she uh, directed me in Sound of Music. And again, I auditioned for her many times and for whatever reason didn't get it, but she always was encouraging and told me why I didn't get it for whatever reason, um, but was never dismissive and, and, and always encouraging. Tony was there day after day when I did, when I did Fair Lady, um, uh, and just, and I, and I would go to him and I'd say, I don't know how to do this. And he'd be the most amazing help. Um, and, uh, and Alan had the biggest impact. Cameron, Cameron mm. had quite a big impact in my life too. Yes, of course. You know, yeah. By, yeah. by, by um, you know, uh, employing me in the first place. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, the, the, what you said uh, about, about influence and, and also and about soaking up advice from people and you know, don't be afraid to do that these people know a lot you know if you don't know who Gillian Lynn was guys again google her but she is 
now uh, most remembered for being the original choreographer of the musical Cats that Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote, uh, that went in and had a very long run at what was then called the New London Theatre. Sadly, Gillian died two years ago? Two, Probably years. not even... And, and Andrew Lloyd Webber, who now owns that theatre, has renamed it the Gillian Lynn, which is rather lovely. And it's the first theatre in London to be named after a woman who isn't a royal. So it's pretty good for Gillian, actually. Um, OK, a couple of fun questions. Um, what's your favourite musical? Well, you know, that's really hard. That's what, I mean, you usually say the one I'm in. <laughs> As nobody's in anything at the moment. Um, of course I love Eliza. Of course I love doing Fair Lady. But I've also loved playing um, Anna in The King and I. And, and I enjoyed enormously playing Maria in The Sound of Music. And one of my favourite roles was playing Velma in Hairspray. So, oh, well, you were, I saw you in that. and you were. His, I mean, it's such a fun show anyway. Um, but... It's a great show and the energy that you get from that show and, and the fact that I was playing this kind of, so it's not evil, but this rather, you know, not very nice woman uh, with a wonderful kind of peroxide blonde wig and everything and screaming because it was, it was all chest again. I loved it. I'm wearing this kind of yellow outfit, very sexy outfit. So I did enjoy that. But I guess my favourite musical, well, you know, it's hard. I mean, my favourite musical I've been in I was, it has to be Fair Lady. Favorite musical I've ever seen, gosh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I absolutely, when Chorus Line first came out, that just bowled me over. But it's now oh. dated. It's now quite dated. It is dated. And it, the last production, uh, which I thought was brilliant and had Scarly Strallen in it, and she was wonderful in it, but it flopped because I think it's just had its day. Um, yeah. I, there's so many more questions. Um, we're not going to get to all of them, but there's a couple of people who I think would like to like ask some live questions. Okay. So, Glenn, do you want to let uh, uh, these some people into the room to ask Liz a couple of questions? Well, okay. Whilst we're waiting for that to happen, um, let's, um, let's, ask, what's your favourite musical of the last 10 years? Oh, gosh. The last 10? What was the last 10 years? What does that take us back to? Um, well, don't count the last year because it didn't happen. <laughs> no. Um, uh, gosh, um, the last, well, the last production, the last production I loved was, was the, um, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar at, uh, Regis Oh, I loved that. Oh, I loved it. I also loved, loved it. it. Ruth, that production, I thought, there's Alexa. Uh, also yes. Loved Alexa, welcome. Uh, your question for Liz. Hi, I was wondering, what is the biggest difference between becoming a stage and theatre actor and becoming a film and TV one? Well, uh, Alexa, um, the, the, the theatre is a much bigger um, size. So, for, for every, so first of all, you have to be, you have to throw your voice more. I think you have your movements are more exaggerated, and film is so natural. Um, and television, I mean, I, I find it they they pick up on everything, especially now with the digital. They can see every single movement on your face, whereas in the theatre they can't. So I, I, am, I am naturally a theatre animal. I am not a natural television and film actress. Um, I find that very difficult to bring everything down and down and down and down to, to the point that, um, I mean, even in life, I'm, I'm, I'm probably too large. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's just, that is the biggest difference, is, is the size and, and being as natural as you possibly can when you're on film. I think Michael Caine constantly, so I've, I've watched a few of his masterclasses and he just says, do less, do, do less. less, do, do less. less. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas in the theater, it's, it'd probably do a bit more because you can't yeah. read from the back of the th auditorium. Um, so that's probably, the, that's probably the, the, big, the biggest difference, Alexa. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Have we got another one, Glenn? Yes, yes, we've got one coming up in a couple of seconds. From okay, Evelyn. well, uh, uh, hi, Eveline. Welcome. It's good to... I can't Hello. There you are. Hello. Eveline, <laughs> welcome. Your question for Liz. Yes. Uh, would you recommend young women to pursue a career in the theatre world, and what is your advice for them? Um, I, I would encourage a young woman to pursue a career in the theatre, uh, as long as she felt that was all she could do. If, if she's a woman who, who has it, who loves it as a hobby, then I say, then keep it as a hobby. Because the one thing you have to face in our profession, and you know, no matter how famous you are, is rejection. And unless, unless it's something that you are prepared to accept for a long time, um, it, it's, it can wear you down. And, and I wouldn't recommend it for someone who 
wasn't prepared to really believe in themselves and have the confidence in themselves that they can do it. Um, and that there's nothing else they want to do in the world. Um, and, and that's really how you go about it too, I'm afraid. It's, it's just hard work. Hard work, constantly refreshing your, your, your um, acting classes, your singing classes, you know, just, and, and this lockdown, because I'm, I'm patron of, a, of a quite a, a, a large performing arts um, school here. And uh, when lockdown first happened, they were all desperate. And all I could say to them was, just keep working. Just keep working at home. Just keep, keep doing your classes. Just keep, you know, I, I'm, and I was saying to um, Simon just before we all joined that my, my goal this lockdown is to teach myself to self-tape because so many auditions now, you have to self-tape. And at my great old age, I've, I've no idea how to do these things. So you have to keep refreshing yourself and, and do take courses and things. But if you, if you are determined, absolutely determined, this is what you want to do, then I would say then go for it. Go for it. Okay. It's really nice to hear. Thank you, Eveline, for that. Um, that's really interesting. Do you still take classes, Liz? Yes, I'm doing online classes in lockdown. Um, yeah. I, I do, uh, I do you're never too old to learn. No, I do a dance class on Sundays um, with, with, my, my, with Dougie Squires and, and his partner, <laughs> it's a young generation. And I do, I do singing lessons with wonderful Claire Underwood twice a week. Yeah. Wow. Me wow. and yoga and things like that. And I've got to teach myself self, self tape. <laughs> and, and obviously at the moment it's lockdown, but as, you, as you've already alluded to, however successful you are, there are periods of unemployment and there are down times. Mm -hmm. How do you protect both your physical well-being and your mental well-being during those times? And obviously at the moment. Just, just you have to keep on believing in yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Joe Milsom, and I, I'm, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this because he's just a, the most wonderful man in the world. He played Raoul in um, Love Never Dies and, and was playing the father in Mary Poppins when that all closed. And he was packing shelves in Asda, you know? You know and, and there's, yeah, but meanwhile, thinking about what else he could do. And it's just, I'm going to show you this. I, I'm so proud of him. Hang on a minute. Um, so also during lockdown, because he's the kind of guy he is, he's written this book called Work, Another Four Letter Words. And it's, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. It's, I think it's an absolute must read for any want, wannabe actor because it's the first 10 years of his life as an actor. And it's fascinating. Wow. It's absolutely fascinating. And he's got his book launched tonight. <laughs> but this is, there we go, folks. Get it. Joseph Milsom, Work and Other Four Letter Words. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Brilliant. That's interesting. That raises a question. Somebody has asked, how important is it having an online presence in the current theatre landscape? Well, I'm afraid I'm, I'm hopeless at it, but I think it is important. I'm afraid it is important. Um, uh, I've, I've, got, I've got a website. I never look at it. It's terrible. Oh, do you? I, I had no idea. <laughs> I see, and I, but I, I should be doing it. I should be on Instagram and all those things. And, but I think, I, I think I'm just too old to really start. But for the young ones, absolutely essential. Look at all these influencers. And who are they? Yeah. What do they achieve? Yeah. Do you know? um, I've, I've, my, my nephew is a great singer. He's, he's, he, does, he does a lot of the cruises. Wonderful singer. He's out there recording and putting himself out. He's got, you know, a lot of followers and you need that because they're the people who are going to come and see you. They're the people who are going to support you um, through the bad times and the good. So yes, online presence, absolutely essential. Thank you. Um, it's a cheeky question, but it's a fun one. Um, do you read your reviews? Uh, not for a while. Um, <laughs> no, uh, um, because you know, if they're good, well, if they're good, they're great, but I mean, but it shouldn't change how you feel about yourself. If they're bad, that's what we think about, the, the bad ones, and you mm -hmm. just, and you're completely demoralized. So, so no, um, and, and most people don't read them. Um, if I read them, I read them well into the run, or even maybe after when the run is finished. Yeah, and I said, the other, the other downside about being online, of course, is you get um, get people who give you the, give you their opinion, which is yes. um, which can be fairly destructive at times. And I think you just got to again, yeah. you've got to believe in yourself, and you've got to believe in what your director is telling you. 
It's uh, this is quite worrying, and I do. I, I I would say this to my own to my own students. You know, there is quite a lot of nasty stuff online, and if you are worried, talk to an adult. Yes. Um, you know, any grown up. If you are worried, don't sit and suffer in silence. No, talk don't. to somebody because this is really really important. You're online a lot, a lot more probably than you were before. I mean, I got a particularly charmless poison pen letter this very morning. So um, you know, really really quite offensive. <laughs> but hey, um, you 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 go with the flow. But please please, and and in a sense, of course, reviews are a bit like that, aren't they? They're an instant well, judgment on something that. The sad thing about, about Love Never Dies was it was killed before we even got started. Yes, because yeah, it was. There, there were these people out there who are, and quite rightly so, you know, avid, ardent, Phantom of the Opera fans, who thought it was completely wrong to do a sequel and to have, you know, Raoul as an alcoholic and all of this, and, uh, uh, and were so outraged that even before we started, they were putting nasty things out on whatever, Instagram and Twitter and things. And of course, it, people read it. People read it and they... Uh, the other the other big difficulty with the West End now is these shows are so phenomenally big. I mean, you mentioned that you did My Fair Lady on the road for a year. So that, that means, guys, literally, you do the production for, say, a month in one city, and then you go on to another and another and another. But, and traditionally, in the old days, musicals would open out of town uh, so that you could fix them. Because uh, as Julie Andrews herself said, musicals are not written, they're rewritten. Yes. And getting something as big as a musical right takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the physical production of musicals is now so huge. I mean, the staging alone is so massive. You can't do that. It's not economic. So you have to open cold in the West End or on Broadway. And because, and, and particularly in the case of Love Never Dies, which, by the way, if you haven't heard of it, is the sequel to Phantom of the Opera. It has the most glorious score. Um, it's a wonderful, and Liz is, plays Madame Giri in it. Get the, well, you don't get CDDs, but you can download it from Spotify. It's a beautiful score. Close your eyes and have the most wonderful time. I have um, to hold my hand. I'm not on the CD, sadly. Are you not? Oh, that's a shame. It was recorded before I came on board, but um, but it's a wonderful score. Absolutely. It is a beautiful score. But the problem was, an, op an early, as you said, there were ardent Phantom of the Opera people who, who just hated the idea. Then the first preview, and of course people can go, no show opens very well. I mean, it's a miracle, frankly, if you start and stop. You know, if you start at the beginning and finish at the end. Car crash, didn't we? A complete yeah. car crash. The set yeah. fell apart. It was just, it was... Oh, I don't know. We were doing, there's a circus scene, and this poor woman who was on a trapeze, she was dropped down too low, and every, I mean, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. It was just an absolute car crash. And I was being told, please get off, get off, because I was things flying around. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. And of course, and then with a perhaps slightly unfortunate title, it became known as Paint Never Dries, because of course that yeah. first previews were so long, because so much went wrong. But it was actually a lovely show. But of course, once... The reviews have come in. There's not much you can do about it. Oh, the device Sierra Boges was in it, who is... Oh, she was... And, I, and, I, and, and if, if any of your students have never heard of her, please look her mm. up. She is absolutely wonderful. Please buy Joseph Milson's book because you will get so much from that. So much from it. Really well. We're coming to the end of our time. Um, I know, it's flown by. I, I can't believe it. Um, is there anything you'd particularly like to, uh, as, as a sort of parting shot, to say to our students? Well, um, lockdown is, will end. It will end. And, oh. and we will all get back together again. And one thing we're going to need more than anything is live performances. So just be prepared. Get yourself ready for it because we're going to need you. And, uh, and we're going to want to see your talent up there and we're going to want to be in the audience applauding it. Okay? Liz Robertson, thank you very much. And thank you for listening in. Next week, um, we will be focusing on Phantom of the Opera uh, with um, the divine Rosie Ash, who was the original Carlotta in Phantom of the Opera and many other shows as well. Um, thank you so much, Liz. Thank you, Glenn and Jake, for doing all the tech, making it all happen. And we will see you all next week. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.